Advice is one of those weird things in life that can either lead you way down the wrong path or totally change your life for the better. As filmmakers, listening to bad advice leads to things like overspending on gear that you don't need or shopping for LUT packs instead of just getting out and shooting. On the other hand, listening to good advice can help you push through creative and professional roadblocks, save you years of wasted effort, and help you reach your full potential much, much faster. Luckily, over the last 15 years as a photographer and cinematographer, I've gotten tons of both kinds of advice, and looking back, it's easy for me to filter the good from the bad. So in this video, I'm gonna share some of the best life-changing advice that I've gotten from top professionals in the documentary industry so that you can learn from it as much as I have and make 2024 your best year ever. So let me just start off by saying that I actually didn't initially plan this topic as a YouTube video, it's actually a book. I just started writing one day while I was on my way to a long shoot, I got stuck in a hotel room for a week because of some wildfires, and the idea expanded from there. It started almost as a journal to myself where I wanted to look back on the people who helped me over the course of my career and what it was that they said or did that made them such an important part of the journey. Because sometimes I think it feels like from the outside that people who are already established in the industry just sort of ended up there one day so i wanted to show you all how much of a long and drawn out process it really is it took me more than a decade to get to where i am now and the more i thought and the more i wrote the more i realized that the things i was writing about were universally relevant to other filmmakers out there so why not just put it out there for other people to hopefully benefit from too and in the end it turned into something really cool like a real book rather than the pdf style guide i'm used to seeing out there. The finished product is almost 70 pages, I think, and I worked with a great designer to mix in a bunch of photos with the stories, and I personally think it looks great. And I'm giving it away for free, so that's a bonus too. I wrote it partly as an educational guide for filmmakers who are trying to take their careers to the next level, but it also reads like a travel narrative memoir because in order to share the advice that impacted me, I really needed to describe the time and place I was at in my career and my life for it to make sense. So if you're looking for practical tips or if you've ever been interested in what it was like to build my career through nearly 15 years of international travel, working in some pretty crazy places with top tier industry pros, this should be right up your alley. There's a link in the description and if you like this video, you'll want to grab that because it's really where most of the details and the personal storytelling are, just because I can go way deeper in writing than I can on YouTube. But in this video, I'm going to cover three of the moments from the book that I think are especially relevant for filmmakers in the early days of 2024. <music> Let's start right at the beginning because some of the most life-changing advice I ever got was before I'd ever been paid a cent for shooting anything. Now this was almost 15 years ago now and at that time I was working as an English teacher in South Korea and any idea I had of making a full-time living with a camera were just pipe dreams still. I'll make a long story short here but basically I watched the documentary War Photographer and as soon as it ended I pretty much knew I'd found something I really wanted to do with the rest of my life. So I did what most people seem to do, I started saving money for a really nice camera an expensive trip and a workshop. At the time, I remember thinking that getting started as a photojournalist was something that I had to work towards, something that I could only do once I had the perfect camera and had boarded a flight to an exotic location. I taught classes every day from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. I saved my money and I waited for my contract to end so that I could finally get going. Now maybe you're already seeing the issue with this strategy, but I didn't at the time. But luckily for me, I was about to cross paths with the legendary photographer Robert Nicholsberg, who would help uh, me see the flaws in my perspective. If you've never heard of Robert, he's as accomplished as it gets in the documentary photo world, and he shot assignments for Time Magazine and all sorts of places in war zones all over the world. Now, it's a pretty long story that I go into in full detail in the book, but for the sake of keeping this video short, I'll just say that a family friend met him at a dinner party, and knowing how interested I was in photojournalism, managed to convince him to let me email him with some questions. And like the real rookie that I was, I sent him a massive block of text that mostly asked him questions about the kind of camera I should buy and what the perfect starting place was to begin my career. I guess I hoped he'd respond with something like just buy X and head to Libya or Iraq or wherever and things will all come together. I really wanted to be easy and to justify all the waiting I'd done, but Robert wasn't having any of it. He did patiently answer my questions about cameras and lenses, but when it came to choosing the perfect place to get started, looking back, his answer was obvious. Right now, wherever you are. Like, why are you waiting 
looking to be somewhere else when there are stories all around you in Korea. That was the gist of what I remember reading anyways, and even though it might sound obvious in hindsight, at the time it was a slap in the face that woke me up from all the excuses I'd been making for myself. Like, what was I thinking? Some people might save their entire lives to be lucky enough to photograph a place like Korea, and I was here on the ground just waiting to be somewhere else. After that email, I managed to get moving, and I even got a couple basic photo stories published in a local magazine before I left, but when I look back, I still kick myself for all the time I spent reading blog posts about how to become a photojournalist when I was living in the heart of Seoul and the real way to become successful was to go out into the city and shoot. Since starting this YouTube channel, I realized just how important this advice is because I get so many emails these days from people who are living all over the world asking how they can get started in documentary filmmaking even though they don't live in New York or LA or wherever. And the advice I give to them is exactly the same as what Robert gave me. You get started by starting wherever you are. If your dream is to make documentaries but you live in the middle of nowhere, don't sit there for two years waiting to be able to afford those flights to Nepal or Argentina. Go out with what you have and find stories in your area to tell. If you can't tell a good story in your hometown, you're not gonna be able to tell a good story in Baghdad or Kuala Lumpur either. Now, I haven't spoken to Robert since then, and I'm still a little embarrassed that I used my one chance to connect with someone of that caliber to ask about DSLRs, but his advice came at the perfect time and it was exactly what I needed to hear. So if you ever happen to see this, Robert, thank you, and to everyone watching, don't be like me, don't wait, just do it now because action is the only thing that works. Now obviously I got there eventually, and once I got started, I went really hard at it. I spent almost two years traveling internationally and shooting nearly every day until eventually I had a decent enough portfolio to show editors. Eventually jobs started coming in and I was able to support myself full time with a camera. That alone was like a dream come true, but I didn't want to let off the gas at all. I was always trying to push myself forward through shooting, but I also went to a ton of portfolio reviews and workshops and industry events, and I was always looking to meet people and get advice on how to get better. And luckily for me, there was a photographer from one of the most prestigious agencies in the world in my neighborhood. I'm not talking about where I live now, though there are some world-class photographers here in Toronto too, but in those days I was living in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, which is a much less likely place to meet a big name photojournalist. But sometimes the universe just hooks you up in random ways and you have to take advantage. Anyways, the photographer was a guy named John Vink, and at that time he was part of Magnum Photos, which is like super elite level in the world of photojournalism. I'd see him all the time when we were out shooting street protests and political rallies around Phnom Penh, and he was always at the local arts events and just generally part of the media scene in the city. So we'd see each other pretty often at documentary screenings and photography exhibitions, and even though we didn't know each other that well, we were still on good terms and we'd always gotten along well. I'd also gotten a couple portfolio reviews done by him over the years at photo festivals around Asia, which were always really helpful, but if you've ever done one of those things, the environment is a bit formal and everything is a little rushed you kind of rotate in and out of these reviewers like speed dating and so you're not really able to just sit and chat with people but one day i made a social media post asking if anyone could give me a lift to a little beach town a few hours outside phnom penh because i think i wanted to take a few days away from photography and just sort of chill out anyways john answered the post and he said he had a free spot in his car and he picked me up a couple days later I'm not going to get too deep into what we talked about because i already put all this in the book but at that time i was at this weird crossroads in my career and not sure what the next move was. I was working quite a lot for some of the biggest outlets in the world like the New York Times and Al Jazeera and even Marie Claire in those days and I was working on a fully funded two-year project documenting the entirety of the Mekong River as well so professionally things were going really well and at the risk of sounding arrogant believe me I didn't feel confident at the time I was a pretty good photographer at that point but I didn't understand how to go from good to great if that makes any sense. Now I was just talking about this in the car and I was probably coming off as super anxious but John just sort of patiently sat there and listened and nodded and then he dropped one of the most helpful pieces of advice I've ever gotten. I'll never forget it. He just turned and said, it's easy. You just have to get better. And then he kept driving. Now I know that sounds pretty harsh and I guess it sort of is, but that's how you need to hear some advice sometimes and always tiptoeing around the truth will just slow down your progress. And I could tell from the way he said it, it wasn't meant to be mean spirited or anything. He wasn't trying to hurt my feelings or something like that. He was just telling me the truth. Now just get better might sound like something really obvious, but it 
actually is the only answer to so many problems out there, especially when it comes to the filmmaking and photography world. These days, a lot of people, myself included, have access to so much information and technology that can feel like there must be some optimization or hack to get us what we want. Like if we just get the right camera or the right anamorphic lens or the perfect Mac Studio or sign up for that course, that we'll get what we want. The truth is though, most of the time, the answer is to just get better. And the only way to get better is to keep working at the thing consistently for a long time and gradually you'll improve. There's no way to cheat the process of getting better, there's just hours and hours of effort. And for me, that was an incredibly freeing thing to hear. It wasn't that I didn't have the gear or the contacts, I just needed to put in the work and the results would come in time. Now don't misunderstand, that's definitely not saying just chill and it will all be fine because that's not at all true. You have to put in serious work, but if you're actually doing the work, i.e. getting better, you'll be one of the few who are because most other people will still be trying to YouTube their way to success. Now when I see someone doing better than I am, maybe it's financially or making more exciting projects or winning huge awards or whatever, I don't let it affect what I'm doing because the only real answer is to just get better. So John, thank you both for the really solid advice and also for the ride because I'm pretty sure I forgot to pay for gas. So from here, I'm gonna jump forward a few years just to keep this video to a reasonable length. And at this point, I had left Asia and moved to Mexico and was just starting to establish myself as a documentary cinematographer instead of a photographer. It was actually on the very first gig I landed with a real production crew shooting a TV show about heroin production in Mexico for National Geographic, where I met Pablo Durana. If you've never heard of him, Pablo is a legendary doc shooter in the world of adventure filmmaking, and he's right up there with the Jimmy Chins and Renan Ozturks of the world, even if he's a little bit lower profile. I'm not gonna pump him up too much because because his resume does that for him, but if you ever need to get a camera into a truly remote spot like a mountaintop in Antarctica or the bottom of the world's deepest cave or onto the side of a five-day multi-pitch rock wall in the Grand Canyon, Pablo is your guy. And those are all real examples of things he's done. He's an absolute beast of a human and an athlete who just happens to make beautiful images at the same time. Anyways, when we met, and this was a long time ago now, like I said, it was my first time working with a big crew and I was brought on as an emergency replacement B camera operator after the original shooter hurt himself by accident. I was really new in my career and I really didn't want anyone to know how inexperienced I was and so I tried to sound super confident which is never the right approach and most people can see right through the act. I'm sure Pablo could see through it too but at least he was nice enough to let me ramble my way through a whole bunch of nonsensical claims about my abilities one of which was something like people like to hire me because I never screw up and for the record I use stronger language than screw up but we'll keep it PG for the algorithm. It was obviously a dumb thing to say and I'm lucky that he didn't just laugh in my face. And instead he said, dude, you're gonna mess up and that's okay. What matters isn't being perfect, it's learning from the mistakes and then not making them again. I think at the time I was really embarrassed, which is a theme for this video, I think, but it's been so true over the years and I think it's true in pretty much everything, not just filmmaking. Mistakes happen and it's in our failures where we really learn and improve. If everything goes well all the time, you're probably not challenging yourself and if you're not challenging yourself, you're not growing. Like when I baked in the monitor LUT over an important shot by accident, accident instead of shooting log like the tech sheet called for. At the time, I thought it was the end of my career and I wanted to hide under a rock. But because of it, I learned to always double check. Or when I put a lav mic on a former president of Mexico in a really bad spot and it ruined the audio on an interview that couldn't be repeated. Now that pushed me to really dial in my lav mic skills and since then I haven't had another complaint. Or when I shot an entire sequence with Zac Efron like five years ago, which is a whole other story in itself, uh, but I used the wrong shutter angle and the footage was right on the edge of unusable. Now I check and double check my settings almost obsessively and it's almost second nature. Look, you're gonna keep messing up throughout your career. I'd like to think I'm pretty good at my job these days, but there are 100% gonna be more times when I make different dumb mistakes. Messing up is never good and some Sometimes it can be a really big deal. But like Pablo said, it's not about being perfect, it's about getting better. And if you do that consistently, then one day you'll be the person standing at the top of the mountain with your camera showing the next generation of filmmakers the ropes. Mountaineering pun intended. So there we go, three pieces of advice I got over the course of my career that have helped me a ton. Advice is funny because it doesn't necessarily need to be complicated or original, it just needs to come from the right person at the right time. And that's why I wrote all this down in the ebook so that I could go into more detail than I can in a short YouTube video video so that hopefully I can get across some of the context a little bit better. Like I said, it's just as much of a memoir as it is a how-to guide. And if you
you do decide to grab it for yourself for free. I hope that some of the stories I share help you as much as the advice helped me over the years. See ya.